Shalom, shalom to everybody. Shalom. It's good to be together as a covenant family. This is the first day of the week after the Sabbath during our week of Matzot. And we have now come to the day of the waving of the sheaf of the first. And every year, as you all are aware, some of you maybe forgot, but I'll remind you, I like to share what this day is about and uh, what it reflects for us and what we can see in terms of this, the significance of this day. And I think a lot of people miss the actual importance of this day. You know, there's some people that think, okay, they read the thing and they think, okay, yeah, we're supposed to do something for the first day of the week and we've done that ticket box and I can do what I want the rest of the day. And they don't actually see that it's a set apart day to Yahweh. Vayikra 23 lists for us all the called out appointed gatherings of our master, set apart gatherings that are to be proclaimed. And he starts with the Sabbath and he said, these are my Sabbaths. And so the Sabbath sets the tone for all the appointments. So this is a Sabbath like day. The difference is on these feast days that we see our master giving us the ability to also prepare what we need to eat and bring before him, but it is a set-apart Sabbath-like day otherwise. So it's an important day, and this day in the context of everything that connects the working of our master from Pesach lamb to all the way through to the ram of ordination or the ram of atonement at Yom Kippur, this is an important day that without this day we can never truly link up the perfect design and pattern of our master's deliverance in our lives. And so I want to go through a few Hebrew and Greek words and the symbolic pictures that they bring for us in recognizing this powerful work of redemption that our master, Yehoshua Messiah, has brought to us, given us to work out with fear and trembling. And much of what I have shared, I have shared before, and for good reason, because we are, you know, we're, we're people that forget things. And just as we go through a cyclical reading of the Torah every year and we gain much insight, so too when it comes to the feasts, it's a reminder, it's a rehearsal of the good, coming good matters. And therefore, when we look at this, we have to be continually reminded of the great work and deliverance that our Master has brought to us and the price that He paid so that we can have abundant life in Him. Amen? So strap in because it will be a good teaching. So if those eyelids are getting heavy, help yourself by keeping them awake somehow. If you don't have somebody next to you to nudge you, then uh, I don't know. We pray for you. What we must take note of is that much of what we read in the Torah that Moshe wrote uh, is that we find very clear images and shadow pictures of our master in Elohim. Our master made it clear to us that in the words that he spoke to the Yehudim who were seeking to kill him, why were they seeking to kill him? Firstly, because he was healing on the Sabbath and because they accused him for making himself equal with Elohim. In other words, making himself Elohim, the one that they were expecting to come. This was the main reason they wanted to put him to death. You are not Yahweh our Elohim that we're waiting for. That's the whole reason. And he said in Yochanan 5, he said, you search the scriptures because you think you possess everlasting life in them. And these are the ones that bear witness of me. Because if they were earnestly seeking the scriptures, they would recognize him. You know? And further in, in Yochanan 5, that's verse 39. In 46, he says, For if you believed Moshe, you would have believed me since he wrote about me. And this angered them even more. Firstly, he's telling them that Avram saw his day. Now he's saying, Moshe wrote about me. It's like, who are you? Well, read Moshe and I'll, it will tell you who I am. You know, and so Moshe wrote of Messiah. And in the letter to the Hebrews, Ivrim, we take note of what is said in chapter 9 from verse 7 to 9. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself for the sins of the ignorant of ignorance for the people. The set apart spirit signifying this, that the way into the most set apart place was not yet made manifest while the tent has a standing which was a parable for the present time in which both gifts and slaughters are offered, which are unable to perfect the one serving as to his conscience. You see, so what we recognize with the work of the master, his blood has cleansed our conscience. The shadow picture parable service of the tent gives us witness of what he's done. And the reason I'm highlighting that passage is to point out the English word parable. One of the things that people struggle with in trying to interpret the renewed writings is that they fail to recognize, and in the Tanakh, they fail to recognize that when our master spoke to the crowds, he spoke in parables. This passage is teaching us that the design of the, and the function of the earthly tabernacle 
that Moshe was told to make exactly according to the pattern that he was shown on the mountain was a parable for us. That service was a parable for us today. And it teaches us of the redemptive work of our master. The Greek word that's used for parable is parabole, and it means a placing beside or a comparison or a symbol or a, a type, a proverb. And this Greek word parabole is used in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Tanakh, as that which is equal to the Hebrew word for proverbs, which is mishle. Mishle ca uh, um, comes from the, the, the noun mashal, which means a proverb, a byword, or parable, coming from, uh, well, in its primitive root, it, in a verbal form, it can mean to compare or to represent or to be like, coming from the verb mashal, which is to speak in proverbs or sentences of poetry. So think about all the proverbs that Shalomo wrote. They were sentences of poetry that are there to give us lessons that are just more than the letters in those lines that he wrote. You know, and so we understand why then when our master says words like when he spoke in parables and he said, the reign of the heavens is like, or the reign of the heavens shall be compared to, because he spoke in parables. So what a parable does, it presents the truth very clearly by putting a fresh light on the matter, as often being presented in a story format that the, that the message is being given in so that the imagery that is known to the hearer can be understood. And it illustrates and sheds light on past, present, and even future events determined by one's individual choices. And so therefore we understand that a parable can only be understood by a true hearer and doer of the word. While those who do not hear in order, to, or, or well, well, they're hearing, but they're not doing, so they do not hear in order to do, they never fully understand the teachings of our master. And when we look at this word for uh, Proverbs, or Mishle, in the, in the ancient pictographic text, that's what it looks like. I hope for the camera that's okay. Yeah, it looks good. Can you see it all there, guys on the sleepy couch? Yeah. <laughs> It's a mim, a shin, a lamet, and a yot. Now, a mim is a picture of water. It can also carry the meaning of chaos, as in the storms of the sea. It also pictures for us that which is mighty or massive or the unknown. Remember in the beginning when the waters were on the face of the earth, there was no order till Yahweh spoke order. And we also understand it can represent the nations and liken to the seas in Scripture where covenant people are likened to the earth because they're covenant of Abraham, if you can count the sand of the sea, etc. But we also understand that it represents washing. And more importantly, in terms of the week that we're in, it can represent that which flows, as in the blood of Messiah that cleanses us. We're told in Yeshayahu that though your sins are as scarlet, they'll be white as snow, and it's only Messiah's blood that can cleanse us. Then the shin is two front teeth. It represents chew or to meditate on and obviously chewing and meditating and getting into the word. So also what comes from our mouth. So it represents the word and that which we meditate on. The lamet is a picture of a shepherd's rod. It represents authority. And so therefore we understand our good shepherd and the authority under which we walk because his sheep know his voice. And the yacht is a picture of an arm and a hand, outstretched arm and hand. It represents the functions of the arm and the hand to work, to throw, to make, and therefore also represents again the outstretched arm of Yahweh, to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed. So what we get from this in the ancient pictographic is that we are cleansed by the washing of the word through the shepherd's work of redemption. So therefore the tabernacle service was a parable of our master's work of redemption. Does it make sense? Okay, so we set that perfectly in order so that we can begin to understand a little bit more about this day and what we're rehearsing, what we're celebrating, what we're remembering, what we're looking forward to as parables that teach us how we ought to live in our master. Our master and good shepherd came to cleanse us through the washing of his word as a husband washes his bride. And coming in the flesh, revealing to us the very arm of Yahweh that saves because no man can redeem another man. And so Yeshua, the man, is actually a clear witness of the prophecy that Yahweh would come born of a maiden. This immaculate conception that's so wondrous for us to comprehend that the creator would choose to come in the form of man, sinful man's form, but yet no, 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 
No sin. Yes, no, no. No, no sin. <laughs> and we're able to understand all through the feasts of Yahweh, the lessons that they teach us, the parables that are contained within, and then understand that these feasts are making very plain to us the revelation of Yeshua Messiah. And with that being said, we can understand then that the sheaf of the first or the, uh, or the sheaf of the first fruits the, and day seven of Matzot that we're going to gather tomorrow to have a closing festival, also a Sabbath-like day, uh, are very clear parables of Messiah. Sometimes we find that the seventh day coincides with the waving of the sheaf, depending on how the week goes. This year, We've got waving of sheaf today. Tomorrow we close the festival. Today's day six of Matzot. Parables that are perfectly told through the clear instructions of our master are to be guarded and they are to be done. We get to rehearse them as they establish for us the proper timing that reflects the work of the master and the hope that we have that we look forward to can remain intact. Sadly, there are so many who are blinded as to the importance of the appointed times of Yahweh. A veil still remains over their eyes when Moshe is read. Shaul reminds us of this in 2 Corinthians 3, uh, 3 verse 14 to 16. It says, But their minds were hardened, for to this day when the old covenant is being read, that same veil remains, not lifted, because in Messiah it is taken away. But to this day when Moshe is being read, a veil lies on their heart, and when one turns to the master, that veil is taken away. Our master made it very clear to his taught ones that they were able to understand the parables that has been given to them who are in him to know the secrets of the reign of the heavens. But those who are outside, parables are heard but not understood. So as we guard and keep the Sabbaths and the feasts of Yahweh, we get greater clarity in our understanding and we gain great insight in the powerful parables that are contained within the instructions regarding his feasts. So it's not just a list of do's and don'ts or what you should do, it's giving us insight and clarity of why we're doing it. So today we're looking at the waving of the sheaf of the first fruits that was to be done on the morrow after the Sabbath during unleavened bread or matzot. And this is given to us in Vayikra 23 regarding this day from verses 9 to 15. So I think it's important that I remind you of these words so that we understand why we're here today. And our brothers and sisters that are online with us and those that will watch online a bit later due to time differences. We thank our master that we get to celebrate this seated in the heavenlies with him. And it says in Vayikra 23, And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and you shall say to them, When you come into the land which I give you and shall reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh for your acceptance. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest waves it. And on that day, when you wave the sheaf, you shall prepare a lamb, a male lamb, a year old, a perfect one, as a burnt offering to Yahweh. And it's grain offering, two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to Yahweh, a sweet fragrance, and its drink offering, one-fourth of a hin of wine. And you do not eat bread or roasted grain or fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your Elohim, a law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, you shall count for yourself seven completed Sabbaths. What we see from verse 10 here is that we are told a sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest was to be brought to the priest, and he was to wave that before Yahweh. Verse 11 tells us it takes place on the morrow after the Sabbath. I know I'm repeating myself, but I want you to understand the perfect pattern in timing that we have to recognize to understand the parables of these feasts. This waving of the sheaf of the first will therefore always take place on the first day of the week. And um, the instructions that were clearly given by Elohim in order to let these events take place on this day shadow picture the parable of the waving of the sheaf in order for us to understand that work which our master did on this day by being both the sheaf of the first as well as the high priest who offers up and waves the sheaf of the first. By Ikra 23 verse 4, our master tells us these are the appointed times of Yahweh, set apart gatherings which you are to proclaim at their appointed times. Devarim 16 verse 16 to 17 says, 
Three times a year, your males are to appear before Yahweh, your Elohim, in the place which he chooses, at the festival of Matzot, the festival of Shavuot, and the festival of Sukkot. And none should appear before Yahweh empty-handed, but each one with the gift of his hand, according to the blessing of Yahweh, your Elohim, which he has given you. Now, as we understand the parable of the pattern of the tabernacle and this going, we know now in Messiah, this pattern continues, but it's not only males, because now in Messiah, there's no male or female. So we all come before his face. And no one comes before him empty-handed. How do you come before his face? This feast of matzot, which is not just the Passover meal. It's not just the ending of the, uh, the, the, the feast. It's a collective of seven days, including the preparation for Pesach. So it's like an eight-day festival, so to speak, similar to what we have at Sukkot. It's this feast. This feast of matzot is the first of the three times a year that each one who was registered appears before Yahweh with the gift of his hand according to the blessing of Yahweh which he has given them. Do you believe that you have now been registered in Messiah having passed through the waters? Then this is for you. How has Yahweh blessed you? This is a feast where you get to show it through the offering of your hand. And I'd like to look at a couple of Hebrew words in regards to the instruction on this day to help us understand the wonderful pictures of our master so that the parable of the waving of the sheaf can be understood and celebrated with joy, not with a heaviness. The term or the phrase, the sheaf of the first fruits in Hebrew is Omer Reshit. So Omer Reshit is translated or the word that's translated as sheaf is Omer. Now, this is important for us to understand in the pattern that we see in Scripture in terms of harvest. The sheaf or the omer was understood to be a dry equivalent or a dry measure of one-tenth of an ephah, which means, uh, uh, and the Hebrew word that's translated as first fruits, in regards to this day, or the waving of the sheaf of the first fruits, is reshit, which means beginning, chief, first fruits, or foremost. And it comes from the root word rosh, which means head, beginning, top, chief, and we understand who our head and chief is, who our beginning is. This day is often called by many people as bikurim, and you'll even have these pictures with the menorah and all the feasts, and they, 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 get, it, they get it mixed up because they have bikurim and shavuot. And the term bikurim is only found to be used in reference to what we will be doing in 50 days' time at the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Pentecost. Don't be offended by the word Pentecost. It's just the Greek word for count to 50. Okay. The Hebrew term Bikarim is found in Vayikra 23 verse 17 with the feasts that we are commanded to call as set-apart gatherings. And it's used where we are commanded to wave the two loaves of bread on Shavuot. As the word in Vayikra 23 verse 17 for first fruits is Bikurim meaning first early ripened thing, ripe fruit, coming from the word bachar, which means to bear new fruit, to constitute as firstborn. So while the bikurim is waved on Shavuot, it's on the morrow after the Sabbath during the week of Matzot that we are in fact commanded to wave a sheaf of the first or better understood as the first of the first or even better understood the first of the bikurim. And this waving of the first of the first actually gives us the assurance of the fullness of the harvest that is still to come. It's vitally important for us to realize this, because without this day and the celebration thereof, there is no assurance that there will be a fruit harvest and an offering. And if there's no fruit harvest and offering, there's no assurance of an end time harvest, making the remembrance and celebration of this day so important. So if we don't have this day, then let's go forward. Then the, the barley and the wheat, bikurim at Shavuot. If that's not there, then the fruit that's normally brought in at Sukkot's not there. And if that's not there, there's no end time harvest. So the first secures the last. So how much is an omer? The sheaf is called an omer in Hebrew. And, and when you see the dry measurement of foodstuffs, it was one-tenth of an ephah. It's equivalent as the merit. It, it's used to measure grain equaling approximately about 22 liters dry equivalent. So that's for an ephah basket. Therefore, an omer is about 2.2 liters dry equivalent, just for those that like maths. So we're told in Shemot 16 that an omer is one-tenth of an ephah. So if you were doubting me, there's scriptural evidence, <laughs> okay? 
Vayikra 27 verse 16 says, And if a man sets apart to Yahweh a field he owns, then your evaluation shall be according to the seed for it. Now listen very carefully. A chomer of barley seed at 50 shekels of silver. In Yechezkiel 45 verse 11, it says, Let the ephah and the bath be of the same measure, so that the bath contains one-tenth of a chomer. I'm doing it on purpose because you need to understand. And the ephah, one-tenth of a chomer. Let their measure be according to the chomer. Okay? So, from these verses that I've just mentioned, we see something significant. That the sheaf is waved on the, you know, is as the first of the first, we see terms omer, Epha and Chomer. And so the sheaf is an Omer. Vayikra 27, 16 tells us the evaluation of a field that's set apart to Yahweh is done according to the Chomer of a barley seed, and that's 50 shekels of silver. That being said, an Epha is one-tenth of a Chomer. You with me? Which would make an Epha of barley seed valued at five shekels. So with an omer being one-tenth of an ephah, that would make an omer of barley to be the valued at half a shekel of silver. So why is half a shekel valuable and important for us to understand from a scriptural perspective? Shemot 30 verse 12 to 14 says, When you take the census of the children of Israel to register them, then each one shall give atonement for his life to Yahweh when you register them, so that there is no plague among them when you register them. Everyone among them who is registered is to give this, half a shekel according to the shekel of the set-apart place, 20 geras being a shekel. The half shekel is the contribution to Yahweh. Everyone passing over to be registered from 20 years old and above gives a contribution to Yahweh. So the half shekel was the price of atonement for each one that was registered in Israel. We're saying today that these were done as a clear pattern of Messiah, who we are now registered in him. And this was the atonement price that was to be taken as a remembrance before Yahweh. The grain that's associated with the sheaf of the first fruits was barley, as it was the first grain that would be harvested each year. Then you get the wheat. So we're going into the season where the barley is ripe, ripens earlier than the wheat, and so the harvest begins till we come to Shavuot. Now the Hebrew word for barley is seora, and it comes from the root word sa'ar, which means hairy or hair. And from this word, hairy or hair, we get the word for goat, which is sa'ir. Now, I'm mentioning this for a clear reason of parables that we're talking about today. The sheaf of the barley is waived, and it's estimated at the price of atonement for each person that's registered. We therefore see the relationship in these words between the goat that is slaughtered for the sin offering in order to make atonement on Yom Kippur, being a shadow picture of the atonement that our master brought through his own blood in order that we might be counted in him and registered as his own. What I also find very interesting when we go through Scripture, a powerful nugget of truth, I mean there's many nuggets, you just got to dig and find them, is that looking at another word that has similar lettering to this root word from which we get the words for goat and barley, and the word se'ar, um, which means hair or hairy, from which we get barley and goat, is with the sin, ayin, and arish, okay? A word that has similar letters is the Hebrew word that's translated as gate, and it's the root word sha'ar, which means gate or door or entrance, coming from the verb sha'ar, which means to think, to split open, to calculate, to reckon, to estimate. Very important when we consider today we're beginning our count. Now, these words are spelt with a shin, a ayin and a reish. So you've got a sin, ayin and a reish, and a shin, ayin and a reish, okay? So it's just the little dot. If you look at your Hebrew letters, either on the right or the left at the top of the shin, but similar before the vowel pointings were there, the similar letters that were given for both of these words. And why do I find it interesting for this day? Well, the Hebrew word for gate, sha'ar, is the word that's used, obviously, for the gate of the tabernacle. Because if it's the word for gate and the gate of the tabernacle, it makes sense, okay? Some of you probably didn't understand that. But it's important to understand that because the Greek equivalent to gate is pule. Now, pule is used to describe the very narrow gate that our master mentions in Lucas 13, 24, when he says, strive to enter through the narrow gate, because many, I say to you, shall seek to enter in and shall not be able. 
What does this have to do with barley? What does it have to do with atonement? And what does it have to do with the sheaf? A whole lot. You know, we know Messiah, our master in Elohim, is the door. And we come to the door. And we also know that it was at the gates of the city where right ruling and justice was administered in ancient times. We spoke a little bit about that with Lot. You know, this is where a proper check would be done, people entering into the city. And our master, therefore, has provided for us through his working of atonement for and deliverance for our lives an entrance into his reign according to his proper right ruling and justice. And as we begin to think about these words and just meditate on the significance of all these words that I'm mentioning to you, some of them might have you've forgotten already, but you look through the notes later and remind yourself, you know, but we find a very powerful passage in another working parable of events in 2 Kings or Melachim Bet, chapter 7, where we see in verse 1, it says, And Elisha said, Hear the word of Yahweh. Thus said Yahweh, About this time tomorrow, a sayer of fine flour for a shekel, and two sayers of barley for a shekel, at the gate of Shomeron. In this verse, we both see the word for barley, seora, and we see the word for gate, sha'ar, being used. You know what Elisha was doing here? We've spoken about this before. I'll just give you a little reminder. This was the good news of deliverance as a parable for us today. And this was to the people in Shomeron. They were surrounded by the Arameans, and they were facing a severe famine and a lack of provision. They were under this immense attack and threat of the enemy, fearing for their lives. I mean, a woman was starting to eat their own children. It was terrible. One of the officers of the sovereign didn't believe this good news that he was proclaiming, and he died. You go look at the end of the chapter. He died in the gate as he was trampled underfoot. He was told, you'll see it, but you will not be able to partake in it. And I encourage you, go read that account, because you'll be reminded that it took four leprous men who went to see if they could find food, because they thought, you know, hey, what's going to happen to us? We're going to die any which way, so let's go. And when they got to the camp, they saw all the enemy had fled, but left everything behind. And what you'll notice from the words of Elisha is that the price that was being declared for wheat and barley was a lot lower than it had been, because you know in times of famine there's inflation. And most people didn't believe there's no ways that that can be the price. And what's worth taking note of here is the barley and the gate. The price of two measures of barley was one shekel. That makes the price of one measure of barley a half a shekel. That's the atonement price for each person, as one measure of omer or barley is a half a shekel. So here we have in Scripture, in tying in with today's rehearsal of this event, a reminder of atonement that we have in our master and the waving of the sheaf of the first and a parable of deliverance being proclaimed through the physical events that took place in history. Who has believed our report, some might say, as we consider these events? The guy that was trampled in the gate didn't believe the report. We're all sitting here today because we've believed the report of the outstretched arm and hand of Yahweh being revealed. And in light of this day, we gather in his name in order to celebrate and proclaim the good news, Yeshua Messiah. Entrance into the reign has been opened for us by his life, death, and resurrection and the waving of the sheaf of the first. The Omer price has been paid. We've been legally grafted into Messiah by his blood in order to serve him forever. Now we have the assurance that if we stay in him, we shall be lifted up when he comes again either from the grave if we sleep before he comes or changed in the twinkling of an eye, each one in his order. So therefore, Omer or a sheaf symbolizes a single person and is in fact a picture of oneself being turned over to Yahweh in the process of becoming useful to his community, his bride. Shemot 16 verse 16 says, This is the word that Yahweh commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need, an Omer for each being. According to the number of beings, let every man take for those who are in his tent. Remember, an omer is one-tenth of an ephah. An ephah basket represents a full basket, a quorum, a collective of people. And in the Hebrew text, wave the sheaf before Yahweh is written as follows. Vehenif et haomer lifnei Yahweh. And literally it can be expressed as, and wave or present the sheaf or the omer before the face of Yahweh. The root word for wave is nuf, 
Okay, obviously written here as vehenif. Okay, because you shall wave. It's so nuf means to move to and fro, to shake back and forward, sprinkle, wave. You know, it's, you get the idea. Okay, in essence, it carries a broader meaning of presenting. Okay, maybe some of the guys were a little bit nervous, and that's why we was shaking. But it's a presenting, coming before the master with confidence. And it's from this root word that we get the word that we will see in 50 days' time for the wave offering, which is tenufa, which means a swinging or a wave offering. So those two loaves in 50 days' time, we wave like this in symbol of the work of our master. Today it's just a sheaf. 50 days' time, it's the whole body. You understand? So it's a wonderful picture. Without this day, we can't understand what Shavuot's about. And this waving of this first of the first, was a public acknowledgement of the great and perfect goodness and provision and protection of Yahweh. And it was done with a sure belief of the one who is the provider for all that we need. Remember, this comes into the beginning of a year where people would come to bring the sheaf of the first, not knowing how the harvest is going to play out. So what this day symbolizes is a pure element of belief. By the time you come to Shavuot and you're now giving a first of the harvest, it's a representation of what you brought in the harvest. You're coming to give thanks. But today is even, in a sense, greater belief because you don't know what will happen in the next 50 days. So it's coming and saying, and it can be based on your past and seeing how he's blessed you because you have some working in that. And if Yahweh hasn't blessed you, you need to introspect, go and look and look inside and see why. Because this is a celebration of belief, not knowing what tomorrow holds, you know. This day of the Omer Rashid is a day where we get to publicly, everyone, each person gets to publicly declare their acknowledgement of Elohim, their Redeemer, their Savior, their Provider. And you know what? It's not just lip service. That's not what today is just about. It is a confession of the lips, but it's a demonstration that is done physically with one's goods. That's what was done every year as a parable of what we continue to rehearse in celebration of our master. What is he? How has he blessed you? What's in your hands? This is a day where you get to publicly acknowledge that. And it shouldn't be a threatening thing because it's you before Yahweh. You know, Mishle 3 verse 9 to 10 says, Esteem Yahweh with your goods, with all the first fruits of all your increase. Then your storehouses shall be filled with plenty and your vats overflow with new wine. Ichezkiel 40 verse 30, 44 verse 30 says, The first of all the first fruits of all and every contribution of all, of all your contributions belong to the priests. And the first of your ground meal you give to the priests so that a blessing rests on your house. That's, I mean, everyone wants blessings on their house. We'll just obey Yahweh. And as parable of the tabernacle and temple service in the master, we understand the master has appointed some to equip the body. So those are the priests of the today that the rest of the body brings I, I double my the there today, you know, that bring. So we still continue in the pattern in the order of Melchizedek. In fact, in fact, <laughs> in fact, in fact, I'm so excited about today. In fact, I'll even go so far as to say that if a person is not bringing a wave offering to the priest, you're not guarding this day as commanded. What we are to remember and celebrate is that Yeshua Messiah, as high priest, offered up on this day the Omer Rashid, the wave offering of the first of the first fruits, when he presented those who were raised after his resurrection. This offering of the first of the sheaf, or the sheaf of the first, it reminds us and secures for us, as I said, the harvest to come. So what took place on this day assures us of the expectation that we can hold firm to. And therefore, it encourages us not to worry what's going on in the world. Because this day, today, is that boosting reminder inside us that it doesn't matter about all those conspiracies out there. Because we have a hope that is sure and secure. Amen? Amen. And it will not fail. As it's waved, when, you know, the, the expectation and the sure hope that we have will not fail because what our master did when he performed the high priest duty on this day to secure his Set apart nation, his priesthood, his treasured possession as a secure bride forever. But by 8 verse 11, we are told that Aharon was to wave the Levites before Yahweh. Now, he didn't pick each guy up and wave, you know. It's again, present them before Yahweh as a wave offering from the children of Israel. And from this very clear picture, we can see how Yeshua Messiah 
as high priest and first of the first, being firstborn of all creation and being firstborn from the dead, presented the first fruits of a new priesthood and a new uh, a set apart nation, a renewed set apart nation. Now that the parable pattern is being given to us to Messiah, now it can be revealed what that pattern is in him in the order of Melchizedek, and he did it on this day. This was the day where the order of Melchizedek was now officially in service of what the parable pointed toward, you know? This in itself is such a powerful revelation as to the great significance of this day. We recognize at the time of Messiah in the flesh, before his death, Caiaphas was the high priest. And remember, just before uh, sentencing Messiah to death, Caiaphas tore his garments, and in many ways this is an act of rebellion because he was not to do so in his position. And so there began... Even in the spirit, this began a change in the priesthood. It wasn't changed just yet because our master still had to die and be raised again and offer as high priest. And so therefore he, became, he becomes and he became the high priest, the only true high priest in the order of Melchizedek forever. And after his death and resurrection and his blood that would be used to cleanse and set apart his own priesthood forever, because now it's not the blood of bulls and goats that were rehearsals and parables of his blood that he would himself take into the heavenly tabernacle. As we read from Hebrews earlier, that, you know, there was no access until he could take it. So by his life, death and resurrection, he presents the first of the first fruits, symbolically therefore presents us as his new bride, as that renewed bride that can come back into covenant that he repairs by his blood to be the very treasured possession, the set-apart nation and the royal priesthood that Yahweh made a covenant with at Mount Sinai and gave a pattern of service to keep that covenant intact through a proper service that would ultimately be clarified in the revelation of Yeshua Messiah. So this day of the Omer Rashid reminds us that we put Yahweh first. And when you put him first, you're putting him in everything. That's the idea. You know, many people don't put Yahweh first because they put everything else first, whether it's whatever. And then they see, is there something left over? And if that's the heart of people, you will see they'll never find themselves being blessed. So this isn't a prosperity message. This is a message of obedience that is rewarded by Yahweh by keeping his order intact in service as a, a people of, of Yahweh that we are called to be. Yeshua was resurrected at the end of Shabbat, the, at the start of the first day of the week, sunset last night. In, in times of where we're at in the, in, the, in the week, go back 2,000 and a bit years, and it would have been last night at sunset that Messiah rose from the grave. Can you picture what it must have been like, you know? Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, fulfilling the sign of Yerna that was for a wicked and adulterous generation, becomes firstborn among those who sleep. Now, there's a number of scriptures where we see our master being clearly identified as first. You know, that obviously in Matit Yohu 1, where we see a maiden will conceive, as I said earlier, this immaculate conception, give birth to a son, call his name Emmanuel, which means El is with us. I mean, that should be a big clue, you know. And Yosef, awakening from his sleep, did as the messenger of Yahweh commanded him, took his wife, but knew her not until she gave birth to her son, the firstborn. Now, Messiah is the firstborn of all creation in terms of the firstborn in the exact image and likeness of Elohim. Colossians, Shaul writes in chapter 1, verse 15, who is the likeness of the invisible Elohim, the firstborn of all creation. Adam was made from the dust of the earth. Then Adam and Chava sinned and were put out of the garden. And then they had children. In the genealogy in Bereshit 5 that we've been through a couple of weeks ago, we see that uh, um, Sheth, Shem, Shem was born in the image of Adam. So there was a corruption of the image. So all the people that were born after because through one man, all have sinned. So when Adam and Chava had disobeyed Yahweh's orders and were cast outside, because Chava was also formed by taking a, from the side of Adam. So none of the two of them were born. Sheth, sorry, it's not Shem. Yes, Sheth. 
I thought it was chef. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay. So we understand that then outside the garden, in the sinful state, in a rebellious state, as part of Yahweh's protection when he made the first sacrifice to put a covering of skins on them so that they wouldn't be in their sin forever if they ate of the tree of life, we see that everyone born from that time on was born not in the perfect image and likeness of Elohim until Messiah, the immaculate conception of a maiden, not of the seed of man. The creator comes in to the earth in the form of that which is born, but now the one that is perfect in the image in order to restore this. It's not that he was never there until he was born. He met with the elders. He met with Abraham. He met with Yitzhak and Yaakov. He met with Moshe and Yehoshua. But in order to restore the likeness and image of Elohim in man, he had to come and do that work himself to overcome that. Because as through one man all have sinned, through the one man all can be saved. Not all will be, but all are able to be if they would call upon him. So he is the firstborn, not because of time, but in the exact image and likeness of Elohim. And also when he died, you know, obviously we know that our master died at just before sunset of the fourth day of the week, after the preparation of the Pesach, he is the Pesach lamb, he dies, and three days, three nights, he's in the heart of the earth. But when he died, you know, we also see um, in Matit Yahu 27, verse 53, the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the set-apart ones who had fallen asleep, coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the set-apart city and appeared to many. This is a passage that's often very quickly read over very fast and like not questioned or taught because a wrong system of worship doesn't know how to expand on this, especially in the season that we're in, what the world is in, where they can't even count three days and three nights. Okay. Yeshua waved this sheaf offering of the souls unto the Father and he presented those who were raised as a sheaf of the first. These graves laid open for three days and three nights when he died. When the veil was torn, there was a big earthquake. The graves of many set-apart ones, not just any set-apart ones, were opened. We don't know exactly who they were. Okay, We're not given a name list, but it was set-apart ones that had died in the master. Their graves laid open, and they stayed open for three days and three nights. Only after the master was raised from the dead did they come up out of the tombs. And that night, last night, picture the scene, go back a bit. Last night... Imagine, you've just had Shabbat, we, you know, now you're preparing for the first of the first, and, you know, it's, it's, you've had a great Shabbat, and, and it's kind of like a, for them, it was a great Shabbat, but yes, what happened to our master? He told us this, and we've got prophecy about third day. Where is he? What's going on? And then they start getting knock on the door by some of these guys that uh, have just suddenly appeared again. Maybe it's people they knew. Maybe it's even people they heard of, old, from of old. Oh, what, what, what would you be like if you, if you just saw people that were in the grave suddenly coming and say, hey, I'm here. It's time for us to, to go to the Father, but I'm just witnessing to you now. What an event. At the death, as I said, the temple veil was torn. And after three days and three nights, after Yeshua was raised, these ones that came out the tomb were taken up the very next morning, today, or taken up today, because when Miriam saw the master in the morning, he says, do not touch me, I've yet still to go to the father. And because these guys were witnessing all over. You can imagine the chaos. Now the religious lot couldn't keep the people quiet, because what now? And he went to offer up this first of the first. And in Vayikra 23, it says, In the day that I read earlier, on the day of the way that you wave the sheaf, you prepare a male lamb a year old. Our master is that perfect year old lamb. And it's in Yochanan 20 where he said, Don't hold on to me. I've not yet ascended to the Father. Now, people get confused about father son roles. He's still in the role of a redeemer in the flesh of man. So, therefore, he subjected himself to that which is man, laid down his deity. So, he's still in the role of the, the, role of the son to redeem us back to the Father. And then in Chazon 22, we see Messiah, the one who is, who died and lives forever, speaking to Yochanan, saying, the one who overcomes, 
I shall be his father and they will be my son. Mm -hmm. So the son becomes the father, as per prophecy of Yeshiyahu 9. The son is born unto us, and among his names it's everlasting father. So still in the role of that which is a role of redemption, he still had to go and present as high priest, you know. And so that day he ascended, he offered the sheaf of the first and offering on the, uh, uh, and the next evening. So tonight, I'm trying to help you understand timing. So tonight he comes and he stands in the midst of the taught ones. They just had the day of the waving of the sheaf. They'd heard reports that some had seen him at the tomb and they're all anxious. No, where have we seen him? You know, and other guys were saying, yes, but we met him on the way and everything else. And then he appears before them behind closed doors because they were afraid of what was going on in a sense because oh, was, the persecution was high. And he stands in their midst and he breathes on them and they receive the set-apart spirit. Now, this was a first fruit, the first of the first of the spirit that would be poured out at Shavuot on those that were gathered. Remember when the spirit and there was tongues and everybody spoke in all the different languages? Okay, that's a reversal of the confusion of Babel back to the unity of Yahweh where everybody could understand the witness. So here we have another first of the first. So Messiah breathes on them the set apart spirit. And here's a wonderful thing to realize. While many of them might have been, oh, what's going on? I don't understand fully. Please make it plain to us. Who is the Father? Who is it? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And they're all like this. And then after they received the set apart spirit, they were able to confess that he is Master Yah. The very thing that Thomas said, uh uh, the next week, uh uh, I have to first see. And when he saw his side and his hands, he said, my master and my Elohim. So only by the set-apart spirit of Elohim can you confess that Yeshua is Messiah. The first fruit of the bride of Yeshua Messiah was commissioned and equipped to go and make taught ones of the nation in the order of Melchizedek. It's also on this day of Omer Rashid that we begin to count to seven. I'm oh, sorry, seven. Count seven, then carry on to 50. <laughs> Okay, we're commanded to count seven completed Sabbaths until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, which is 50 days later at Shavuot. Now, it's not seven sevens as some people with their weird calendars try and get involved in. There has to be seven completed Sabbaths. It's very important. So it'll always be the first. So Shavuot will always also be on the first day of the week. And that's why the believers were gathered there. It wasn't now a new covenant that now the old's gone and now the church has established something new. No, the believers that were gathered there were keeping this commands of Yahweh as according to Vayikra 23. And so we know 50 is symbolic of the Yovel, the release. And I just want to touch on a couple of words for counting because the root word that we typically understand for count in our instruction to count 50 days is Safar. It means to score or mark as a tally or record or celebrate or commune or inscribe, recount. So far is that we get the noun from the verb sefer, or sorry, sefer is the verb, and from that we get a noun, sefer, which means a document, a writing, a scroll or a letter. And this word is used to describe the book of the Torah. We are to be a people that are continually counting in our master, meditating on the Torah day and night, as Yehoshua was told, to be strong and courageous and not let the sefer of the Torah, the book of the Torah, depart from your mouth, but you will meditate on it day and night so that you guard to do all according to all that's written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and be successful and act wisely. Sorry. If we don't count, we can't retain the cleansing. Mm. Many people get a, get a washing, but they fall away because they don't count. And this season of counting reminds us that we are to be a counting people every single day. Safar so uh, um, is used 161 times, and it's translated as tell, told, number, declare, numbering. And this is the only other one I want to show you in the pictographic script today. So you've got a samek, a pay, and a riash. A samek is a picture of a thorn. And as we know, nobody really likes thorns. <laughs> hey, Henry, when you were doing the, what was that bush? <laughs> the Bogan Villa, you got, you got pricked a few times, you know. So it represents pierce or sharp, but it can also represent that which protects like a shield because, you know, a shepherd would put a, a hedge of thorns in the gateway to or around, around the sheep and he would sit in the gateway as the door of the sheep. That was kind of the custom to protect them from the 
to protect them. Can you all see it? Okay, there we go. To protect them from the, the, the wolves or anybody that was trying to steal them. The pay is a picture of a mouth. It represents speak or blow, um, the functions of a mouth, or to, even to scatter. And what comes out of your mouth? Words. Okay, so it also represents similar to the shin, but it can also mean word or words. The riyash, as we've mentioned, is a top chief head. So when we look at this pictograph, grab hold of the word of the head. That's what true counting entails. If you're not clinging to the master, you're not counting. And clinging to the master involves one's hands. And therefore, our hands speak of what we do. So if we are not hearers and doers of the word, we're not clinging to the master, we're not counting. And if we're not counting, we cannot be received. Then we won't be counted worthy. Make sense? And also what we see from this is a wonderful picture of drawing near to the master. When we confess, when we bring our sins, as pictured by the thorn, and confess them with the open mouth to Yahushua. Our Messiah, the head, is the one who cleanses us. So this helps us understand the season of counting is recognizing, you know, when he gives the parable of those that when you want to build, you know, you don't, if you don't sit down and calculate the cost and then you carry on, you didn't have enough to finish and people are going to mock you and say, oh, look what you did. So many people live that way today. They get running off into a thing don't think carefully about how am I going to do this. I mean, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we still got to calculate and think about our actions and what will be the consequences thereof. Yeshua is this very Omer Rashid that was waved, and he is our high priest that waved the Omer Rashid. He's the bread from heaven. He paid the atonement price for us all. He is the first fruit and the beginning and the end. And if we don't properly count the cost of following our master, we may just end up being unable to finish the race that we so eagerly began. And that's why this counting is so important from today. Every year, or some years, but this year I want to do it again, so I hope you're not falling asleep too quickly. I just want to explain this period of counting in the picture of some of you this year have been trying to make some unleavened bread, you know, and I hope you've been successful in it. But I want to give you a picture, a typical process of making bread and how we can learn from grain to loaf, what it means to be in the master. Now, this I've broken down into 10 steps as helping us realize what's expected of us as a part of the body, because each step teaches us valuable lessons of who we are in the master and how we can end up being the acceptable bread community that he comes to dwell in the midst of. The first one is, in order to get some Grain, you've got to sow seed. Sowing or planting. The Hebrew term that's used for sowing or planting also uh, uh, carries the idea of scattering because the ancient picture would be that the, the farmer would have like a sling bag around his shoulder with the seed in, his, in the bag and he would walk and he would scatter the seed, you know. That was one of the ideas. In other words, it was way also understood as broadcasting the seed from the bag that was hung over one's shoulder. We, in, the, in many ways, because of what our forefathers did and because of breaking covenant, remember Yahweh scattered Israel, you know, a covenanted people. And so I'm also aware, I'm sure that you are all aware of the sowing and reaping principle that we see in Scripture. Nothing can be reaped from that which is not sown. I know some people like to think that, but it doesn't work like that. You can't reap something different from what's been sown. Some people think they can too. Reap. You will reap what you sow. It, be it your attitudes, your thoughts, your actions, or even your priorities. Don't expect to get something out of that which you did not sow. If you want an intimate relationship with Yahweh, then you need to sow the time and effort in seeking him truly. Yahweh scattered Israel, and you get this understanding from the book of Hosea, which is all about the scattering of Israel and, and the return of Israel, Ephraim. Scattered but watched over. For this scattered seed will bring in a bountiful harvest. But in the meantime, there'll be Donel growing up in the midst, and at the end, there'll be a separation. The Hebrew root word for scatter or sow is zerah, which means a sowing, a seed, or an offspring, coming from the verb zara, which is to sow or scatter. And we also recognize that in the process of becoming an acceptable bride 
and set apart people before the master, we are to sow righteousness and seek him. Hosea 10 verse 12 says to us, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap according to loving commitment, break up your tillable ground. It is time to seek Yahweh till he comes and rains righteousness on you. So it needs to be sown. So we understand from a principle, if we're not going to sow time with Yahweh, we're not going to reap the reward of that. Then comes the growing. Once the sowing takes place, and then comes the growing phase. And there's a season of, or period between sowing and reaping. It doesn't happen immediately. You know, when people don't see immediate things, they get anxious. And it's during this time of growth that it occurs that, that we see, in a sense, it's for us to think about, okay, where was I? What did I do wrong? How can I do better? How can I grow? One of the keys to overcoming this period of growth or period of exile, if you will, is to simply just do that. Just grow. Grow up, will you? You know, grow, grow and grow and grow some more. We have to realize that we have inherited lives. We inherited a whole lot. But in realizing that, we also begin to grow and realize and know Yahweh's power. And more importantly, we understand his name and we call on the name that saves. And to know from a Hebraic understanding, is to walk, to know Yahweh, is to walk in his Torah, to obey his commands. Love for Yahweh is obedience to his commands. Love for one another is obedience to his commands. And so love for Yahweh and one another grows when we obey him. We can outgrow our exile. Most people think they're so stuck in what they've been brought up in. The more the world grows dim before our eyes, it has no effect on us, pulling us this way and that way and, put, and, and, and trying to compromise our obedience. And therefore, we, are, we begin as we grow to be ready to be lifted up when he comes and be replanted where we belong, that is together with him in his land. So we are sojourners here as we grow. And the two Hebrew root words that we can find for grow or growing, one is halach, which means to walk or to grow, or to wander, or to travel. The other one is tzamach, which means to sprout, spring up, or grow. And so a derivative of tzamach, you will all remember, is tzemach, which means a sprout, a growth, a branch, or shoot. The branch or shoot of David, or Yishai, mm. you know, which speaks of Messiah, the tzemach. When we're looking at these words, to grow or to be growing, then Yochanan Aleph becomes clear in chapter 2, verse 6, when it says, the one who says he stays in him also ought himself also to walk even as he did. When we stay in Messiah and walk as he walked, we grow. You know, our ability to grow as we should is only done when we stay in him. For more on the branch of Yahweh, I did a message a few years ago. I think it was 2017 around there called Yahweh, our righteousness, the branch revealed. And that can be another additional one to go with a revelation of Yeshua Messiah. Then comes after the growing, the reaping. The reaping process is used simply for separating the harvest from the field that it grew in. Grain must be reaped, otherwise it can't be used. Just as Avraham, we too have to be reaped out of our circumstances and sometimes even out of our families. Grain, when reaped, is gathered into storehouses. And what a wonderful picture that is for us today as we see this happening more and more in these last days. Pretty much the equivalent of him gathering and assembling his grain into communities. Because, to put it plainly, a single kernel of grain cannot be, make much bread. And certainly not enough for an offering unto Yahweh. Once gathered together, this is actually when the preparation really begins. And most people say, no ways. How, I mean, how can this be? In false systems, they like to use these images and think this is where it ends. Then they come up with rapture theories. You know? This is only the beginning, and the next steps that follow is what shapes us to be set apart community in the master. This that we are gathered together in his name, this place as a people, not the bricks and mortar, but we as living stones, is one of his storehouses where we gather together in him and we're trusting for much grain to come together, you know, being made ready and prepared 
The Hebrew word for reaping is katsar, it means to reap or harvest. And then after the reaping comes in is the threshing. This word in itself sounds so, <laughs> you know. This is why you see so many people stopping at the reaping phrase, because they don't like threshing. And therefore, they don't like the disciplining that's necessary, you know. Most people prefer to not have any threshing in their life, you know, it's quietly sit in a barn, no use to anyone at all. Easy to understand why nobody likes to be threshed because it sounds like thrashing, and that's exactly what it is. So many people left the reaping stage into threshing or thrashing, soon want to jump back to the safe old barn of a no good premature stop. The Hebrew word for teach, this is when teaching really starts to begin. Hebrew word for teach, lamad, actually also carries the meaning of to prod with a stick, <laughs> you know. And so it is with threshing because what it's highlighting for us, it's simply applying pressure to the grain. Be it from beating or grinding or letting heavy animals trample over it. With a purpose in mind for loosening the shells and separating the grain from the chaff. Or the stalks from the husks. And that is still pretty much useless at this stage, but it's necessary. If the stalk, it's the stalk that represents that which attached us to the field that we were reaped out of. And we don't want that to be an ingredient in the bread, so it needs to be separate. Most of what we bring in from the field, be it the dogmas of Rome, Rome be it the doctrines of man, the theologies, the misguided moral codes and wrong priorities that we picked up along the way, those things that are no longer used for us once we've grown enough and have been separated from the system, in other words, when those things have been threshed out of our lives, because now we're not attached to those things, and that's not always a painless process. For some, it's more painful than others, but each one has their unique walk. We are now threshed out enough to begin to study the Torah. The Omer basket is filled with kernels. Each one has a husk that has to be removed. The stalk's been removed. Now the husk has to be removed. And all too often, we don't really want this to happen because we often find ourselves hiding from one another behind the husks, so to speak. Those very things that need to get out of our lives. We can't be part of the bread, the community, if we're hanging on to the hull. The hull, for those that don't know, is the outer part of a seed or fruit. Now, we must begin to be honest and give an account for ourselves and ask, what am I still attached to that is actually useless for the kingdom of Elohim? In this threshing process, we must allow our trusted brothers and sisters in the body to loosen our kernels, <laughs> so to speak. We've got to loosen each other's kernels. You know that. <laughs> now, don't try and loosen others' kernels if you don't want your kernels loosened. You know, it's a, it's a joint effort. And in the process of making bread, think about it. It's the people who get the job done. Each of us has a responsibility to help one another in these processes. It's a great honor and a privilege that requires faithfulness and trustworthiness. You cannot figure this out on your own, no matter how hard you try. You can't. We are, in effect, taking what protects people into our hands, and whatever we learn about them in the process must be used to help build them up, not break them down. We need to be threshed out of the field from which we came from, and we must realize that we cannot keep holding on to those things that previously shaped our thinking, especially when it contradicts the Torah. What we also realize is all we can do is repent, and it's a critical step in being able to move on because repenting is a turning away from and turning to the right way. Threshing is a must. It's not easy, but it's a must. Those husks and hulls must be loosened off. And then we need to get those things that we thought gave us security out of our lives. Because, you know, yes, it puts us in a vulnerable state. How many of you, when you came onto this walk and you realize everything's wrong, you felt very vulnerable? That's the place when you begin to realize that your only security is in Yahweh. Threshing in the Hebrew comes from the word daish coming from the verb douche, which means to thresh, tread, or trample. I mean, even the word douche, it's got that sound, you know. We all need a douche. <laughs> okay. Then comes the winnowing. 
Another step in the process, it involves a fork. You've all, it's like a rake, you know, you've even heard of the winnowing forks, you know. Some of you might have used it in your time. The threshing grain is thrown up into the air in order to expose it to the wind, which would blow away the lightweight particles and the heavier, that is the more important, would be able to be left behind. This process was always worked better on a hilltop. Most of the threshing floors were done on the higher hills because that would be a better way to help the separation, the threshing process or the winnowing process. And this process teaches us a valuable lesson of how we are to be elevating one another. In other words, lifting up one another in prayer, edifying one another into the presence of our master, where the wind or the ruach can blow away any unneeded stuff in our lives. And you know, when we do this together, that's when we spend time with each other, praising our master, that those things that shouldn't be there are easily blown away. You see, it's all very... It, all very, it's, it's very hard on your own to lift yourself up into the air and let stuff bl blow away. We need each other together in community so that the more that we commune in our master together, the more the light weight matters that shouldn't be around can easily go away. You know, we need to th let that which is useless be blown away by the spirit of Elohim, the word of Yahweh. The more that you're in the word, the world goes strangely dim. Those lighter things go away. And what's left behind is refined kernels with no chaff. Shaul said to the Corinthians that he desires that they all spoke in tongues, but he'd rather that they prophesy. Why? Because prophecy builds up the body. Tongue is for the individual unless there's an interpretation. But prophecy in itself is there to edify others Edify the body, elevating others into the place where the spirit can now remove the weightier matters, or the lighter matters, not the weight, the lighter matters. Winnowing comes from the word zara, which means to scatter, fan, or winnow, similar to sowing seed, because you've got to think it's being thrown up kind of thing. Then comes the parching. So after being separated from the lighter elements, all that airy, fairy, fluffy junk that just clogs up our lives, and it's got no use. All it is is hot, puffed up air that some people somehow still want to hold on to. But when that's gone, when that's gone, you know what happens? The heat gets turned up. It gets hotter. Once we are a taught people who have been elevated, we can be exposed to the things that we would never have considered before. Because if there's a lot of light, fluffy junk still around, you never really get to the weightier matters. It's like you still need the milk of the word. I'm mixing my pictures here but you, you get the understanding where now it's almost like we begin to start being able to eat the meat of the word and get greater understanding it's, inter it's interesting to note that at this stage of parching it would be useless to parch a single kernel, I mean you're, it would take you forever okay and so you know what, we're all parched together no one has to go through this alone this is this is not the burning of the grain. It's a process of removing moisture from the kernels in order to make it even lighter. And what this pictures for us at this stage is that we begin to give less weight to me, myself, and mine kind of attitude and rather consider what's best for one another and the whole bread, so to speak. You know, it's so difficult to give up individual rights in the flesh. But we can when we're in it together. Parching may cause tears. In fact, more often than not, it will. Think about it. Tears is a release of moisture, isn't it? So this is the parching process. To parch in Hebrew is the word kal, which means to toast, parch, or scorch slowly. Sometimes this parching is not a quick thing. Then comes the crushing. Oh, come on. How much more do we have to go through? In ancient times, all bread was known as what is called stone ground because, in fact, many archaeological sites, you find many ancient millstones being found or parts of them, and a millstone was two huge concrete stones that were used for crushing. Grains were crushed between the stones, and in many ways, the two stones of the millstone, in a parabolic idea of understanding that we're the bread of Yahweh, it reminds us of the two tablets of stone, the witness of the words that Yahweh spoke to the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai. The kernels are not destroyed in this process. In fact, 
they are actually now becoming use, usable and useful. Usable, useful, same thing. The kernels are now not separated as individuals, but they can become one flower and become an inseparable mix, which is a picture of a people who have the same purpose, the same mind, the mind of Messiah. And at this stage, we can safely say that a bird cannot come and snatch away a single kernel. There's no way to identify a single part of this bread now or these kernels being crushed together. It's like this. As we obey the Torah, love Yahweh and love one another, you know what happens? We begin to become inseparable and we begin to become one. Our master prayed in Matthew 17 that we become one. To crush or grind in the Hebrew comes from the word tachan, which means to grind, and the word tachana is used for a grinding mill. Then comes the sifting. In the Second Temple times, it was recorded in many writings. I'm not saying this is according to the Torah, but the practices that they did teaches us some lessons in the process. In the Second Temple times, the offering for Shavuot was believed to have been sifted 13 times, letting it become finer and finer and finer. And typically, uh, um, we understand 13 re represents the numerical value for the Hebrew word echat, which means united, unified, or one. And so the closer we get together through obedient living and fellowship, the more refined we become. Those who are crushed with us are our true neighbors. One thing we have to realize is that if I do not bring my part and I'm causing disruption in the body, causing the refining of the body to stumble, then it gets sifted again. And you know what? You might just get sifted out. The word for sift as is nuf. Remember I said nuf to wave? So again, it's you're tested. Because then comes the testing, which carries on with, it's, it's the similar process, but testing comes as a body or as a loaf. The temple treasurer in the ancient times, according to the writings, they would come and he would plunge his hands into the refined flour and it needed to be so fine that when, there wouldn't be any flour still on his arms. You know, Kayla, you were struggling with a lot of flour the other day, you know? <laughs> in fact, they were so strict that if it adhered to his flesh, it would be refined again or, or you know, um, and what we see here, this isn't a case of what teaches us valuable. It's, it's not, this strict procedure might seem like, what's the use? But it's not a case of, oh, well, it's their problem or it's someone else's problem. All of us have to be sufficiently refined together. None of us can become the complete bread. It's a responsibility of everyone to become part of. If you do not bring your part to the body, for the sake of this teaching, the loaf and the batch is failing the test due to your inconsistency and compromise and whatever it is, not ready, getting ready, rid of the light stuff, whatever it is, you may, as I've said, just be simply sifted out. Remember, Satan is the one who desires to sift us out. He asked Yeshua if he could sift kefir. Mm. We need to be careful that we're not sifted out by continually failing the test. We learned yesterday, Avram failed a couple of tests, but he passed with flying colors because he learned through that. In Hebrew, the root word nasa means to test or pry. Uh, try, not pry. Please don't pry. Test or try. And it's used in Devarim 13 verse 3 where it says, Do not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for Yahweh your Elohim is trying you. To know whether you love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being. When people are heaping up for themselves those that tickle the ears, we go back and you say, when that dreamer of dreams or prophet comes and he's leading you away, firstly from unity of the body, and now questioning, you know, why do we need to do this command? Yahweh's trying you. He sent that teacher that you went looking for. He, so he's trying you. Do you love him? Then comes the baking. But obviously before the baking, moisture is added. Okay, kneaded into bread, permeated with the good leaven, and then baking. Once it's tested, it can be baked, presented fresh unto Yahweh as the first fruit of wheat or barley at Shavuot. And so because it has been permeated with the kingdom, it will be able to be presentable before the Father. We spoke yesterday about the woman and Sarah and the three measures of, of um, meal. 
At Shavuot, too low, as I said, are presented. And we see a, a couple of root words in Hebrew that are used for bake. And it's important to understand it because we understand this part of this process. One is afar, which means to bake or cook. Bashal means to bake, boil, ripen, grow ripe or seethe. And seraph means to burn or to be set on fire. It's another word that's used because you got to understand you need a bit of heat. So when we look at all of these, we get the idea of the ultimate process of bringing us together as presentable and an acceptable bread before Elohim is that we are to grow and we are to be on fire for him. Fan into flame. Another word which carries great significance for us in the understanding of a bread making process is the Hebrew word lavan. Now, lavan isn't put into the bread, but I'm using this word for good purpose because lavan means to make bricks. And it comes from a primitive word that means to make white. This word is used in Bereshit 11 verse 3 when the men wanted to build a tower to the heavens and make bricks and bake them. This was a wicked time, a wicked building. Yahweh came down and caused a confusion and sent them throughout the earth. When we see the word used in reference to how the bricks would be made through baking, we can reflect on how we are called to be living stones in the master being built up in him. And then we're also told as his dwelling place, our master tells us those who overcome will be given a white stone. You can read that to the assembly that's uh, uh, in Chazon 2. And you'll be given a white stone and a, a renewed name. The process of making bread, I think, is extremely important for us to understand in how we become overcomers in Messiah so that we can receive that entrance into the reign as identified as his, purified from all leaven. We need to pre prepare as we celebrate and work out our deliverance. Our master has begun in us in becoming our Passover lamb, our first fruit, the living bread of which we are bo his body, and this commanded period of counting is a time of assessing our lives as we become more and more integrated into the body of Messiah. From Pesach to Shavuot, we see from, bar well, from barley to wheat, from matzah, unleavened bread, to lechem, bread with leaven, from impurity to purity, from Mitzrayim to Mount Sinai, the mountain of Yahweh. And what we can see is that this is a wonderful time for us to consider this being called out of darkness, being delivered from the bondage of slavery in Mitzrayim, and then seeing that how our master now has us on a journey to a secure place in him. The English word for count you'll find 31 times in the scriptures edition, translated from four different words in Hebrew. One is mana, which means to weigh out, enroll, and this word is used when Avram was told, if you can count, if you can mana, the sand of the sea, you know, or the dust of the earth, not the sand of the, the dust of the earth. So your seed shall be counted too. Mm -hmm. Then obviously safar, we know, kasas is another one, which means to estimate, divide, make your count. And it's used in the instruction about making your count for the lamb regarding the each home for the Pesach. So it's all this calculation, estimation. Chashav is another one, which means to plate, to weave, to plot, to think, to compute, to value. It's used 124 times, and it's also translated into English as in tendered, thought, or designer. So why I'm mentioning these is because to count's not just, oh, one, two, three. It's like thinking. You've got to think. You've got to, that, you've, got to, you've got to really understand what you're doing. And so when we're cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, we see by the cleansing of the leper, after seven days, and when he's washed and he's clean, we see this picture of our master has cleansed us from all the leprosy of sin. But how we compute that in our minds is very important because we're warned in Hebrews, if we purposefully sin after having received the knowledge of the truth, there is no other slaughter of it. On the topic of counting and taking up our stake, our master said, when I mentioned earlier about the guy that didn't count the cost, if you wish to build a tower, do you not sit down first and count the cost, whether you have enough, enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid the foundation, is unable to finish it, many will mock him and saying, this began to build but was unable to finish. When we become followers of Yeshua Messiah, many might ask, do I have what it takes to finish? The obvious answer in yourself is no. But that's why Shaul says, thanks be to Yeshua Messiah. Because 
our resources that are necessary come only for Elo from Elohim. He's given us all that we need for life and reverence. And what Yeshua was talking about here was total commitment and enduring, persevering heart. Stop giving up when the going gets tough. Do not want be one of those who follow Yeshua wholeheartedly and then give up. Like the 70 taught ones that found it a hard teaching saying, how can we eat your body? A true follower of Yeshua Messiah doesn't shrink back and get destroyed, even when setbacks come. But a true follower is one who believes and is saved, who lives by belief through works, belief obedience, Torah obedience. Mm. And when the going gets tough and the chips are down, they keep living by belief obedience. Often people are committed, but only for a while when things seem to be rosy, you know, and through various reasons, they begin to drift away. And then when they drift away, Donnell gets sewn into their hearts and then they can't identify the difference. And then they find themselves like, well, do I really, I don't really care anymore. The question we ask ourselves today as we begin our count is, are you, have you, and will you continue to count the true cost of discipleship? The Greek word that's used for count is sephizo. And this word that's used, sephizo, in the master saying, did you not, don't you sit down and count and estimate if you're trying to build. This word is used in Chazon 13 verse 18, where it says, here is the wisdom. Here is the understanding. Let him calculate or count the number of the beast. For it is the number of man and his number is 666. Oh, what does this mean? Please go see the teaching on Chazon 13. You'll get greater insight into that. This is very awesome stuff because our need to properly count requires us to have wisdom and understanding. We are told to get wisdom, and with all you're getting, get understanding. And as we know, we are instructed by this to not forget and not turn away from the word of our master's mouth. When we begin to grasp how important it is to count and count correctly, we gain understanding into the word. And when we keep his feasts and understand the parable of the feast and what it entails for us, we get more wisdom. We grow in that wisdom. And in the doing of it, our understanding grows. And when our understanding grows, we begin to easily, more easily, be able to calculate the number of the beast. In other words, we recognize what is of Yahweh and what is of the beast, what is of man and the flesh. If we don't properly count the cost of following the master, we may just end up being those that can't finish the race. Another Greek word that's used for count is hegomai. It means to lead, command, consider, account, su suppose, think carefully upon. And it's used 30 times and translated also as governor because anybody who's leading you should be able to count. And if you're leading others, you should be able to count because you shouldn't be the blind leading the blind into a ditch. Yaakov 1 verse 2 uses hegomai when he says, my brothers and sisters, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. He didn't waste time in his letter. I mean, it's in the second verse of his letter, opening statement, telling us to be account, uh, uh, accounting people and linking that concept to Shavuot and beginning our count to Shavuot, the joyful feast of wheat and barley that's brought in, we realize that we must count it all joy to be in the master. This is what today is about. It's a celebration that because of him being lifted up on our behalf and him lifting up the first of the first, that he's the one that will come and lift us up. When we recognize the need to look more closely at the, command, uh, the, the master's commands and counting the cost of following him, we realize that that comes with some heavy decisions to make at times. In fact, he tells us that if anyone comes to him and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters in his own life too, he's unable to be his taught one. And whoever does not take up his stake and follow him is unable to be his taught one. So it's, he wasn't saying you must deliberately go hate somebody, but when you're not putting him first, you can't be a taught one. You can't be a counter. Hard words they might be, but he was basically saying you must put your total trust in him and not in others. As much as none of us like or, like or want to be hated, because our master said you'll be hated by all for his name's sake, but when we endure to the end, we will be saved. Shavuot is a picture of the Yovel release that we're looking forward to. At Shavuot, we remember we were slaves in Mitzrayim. At Yom Teruah, we remember that we're betrothed. We remember the sounding that takes place on Shavuot. So now today, we are also reminded 
of our ability to count. There's a journey ahead, you know. This time of counting is a recognition of how we've been rid of sin and looking at the bread process. All the light and fluffy junk is out of our lives. It should be. And it requires concentration, you know. Maybe I've been speaking too long for some people. It's like, I don't know how to keep concentrating. You've got to learn to concentrate. Because that's what's going to keep you standing in the master, you know. It requires a daily choice of choosing life over death, blessing over curse, and the joy that this responsibility brings must result in, an, in our alert ability to call many out of darkness, whether they want to hear or not, through our lives being a fragrance of Messiah. When the sheaf uh, being waved by our master himself, we recognize that the harvest is now begun because one of the key aspects of this that the harvest would not be able to be started until the priest would wave the sheaf of the first. So when we think of this, we don't say, oh, we'll get to it later. Don't say four months to the harvest. It's a picture from Shavuot to Yom Teruah. The harvest is ripe. The workers are few. Praise Yahweh, we're here today because we've been enlisted as workers, servants, friends who know his business. And as we give remembrance to this day and the importance thereof, we're reminded to put first things first. We acknowledge the work of our master. We also publicly declare before his face that we will be workers in the harvest. Lifting up our hands before his face, bringing before him our declaration of our best as symbolized by our act of belief in bringing the sheaf before his face. To say, this is my celebration of you. This is how I see you blessed me. I'm ready to keep working for you. And as we give remembrance to this, we are reminded to put him first and make sure that our priorities are put in a proper order as he is master in Elohim should be first in all. On this day of the waving of the Omer Rashid, what do you bring before the face of the master? Yeshua met these requirements of this feast for sure. And Yochanan says that we who stay in him, as I mentioned earlier, must walk even as he walks. So we too must come and give our best, declare our best, giving our all unto Yahweh, being continually prepared as a set-apart bride who's making herself ready, a bride that's rid of the leaven of sin, yet becoming permeated with the good leaven of the kingdom. And this day is a wonderful day in being able to declare your commitment, your thanksgiving, your determined belief in the master, not just with words that are just hot air, but with action of obedience. On this day of the sheaf offering of the first that's waved before the master, we give a great shout. The resounding shout that's going on in the heavens today, we want to be part of that, I mean, as it is in the heavens, let it be done here on earth. And as we consider the significance of this day, may this symbolic waving of the uh, um, the waving of the first and the symbolic lifting of our hands unto him before our true Elohim remind us how we are his treasured possession. Then, and in knowing that comes the responsibility of serving him every single day. As we celebrate this Omer Rashid, let's be reminded to be committed, to be steadfast. Beginning our count today for 50 days, we're commanded to count every day. Don't come two weeks down the line, oh, I've been so busy. What day is it now? Count every day. As you celebrate this waving of the Omer Rashid, what do you bring? And if anybody wants to come before the master, nobody should do anything under compulsion because I've shared the truth. Don't feel now, oh, now I'm obligated to do that. That's not the heart that Yahweh wants to come. If your heart has not been prepared to do so, that's between you and Yahweh. But this is a time and a celebration to do so that you want to do something, this is it. And I'll close with the words of Sheol before performing, Shaul, not Sheol, not the words of grave, no, the Shaul, before performing the wave offering before the face of our master. Two passages I just want to read. One is Ephesians 5 verse 2. And Shaul reminds us, Shaul reminds us, and walk in love as Messiah also has loved us and gave himself for us a gift and an offering to Elohim for a sweet-smelling fragrance. And in Romans 12, a passage you all know very well, but I'll remind you in verse 1 to 2, I call upon you, therefore, brothers, through the compassion of Elohim, to present your bodies a living offering, set apart, well-pleasing to Elohim, your reasonable worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you prove what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. Amen? 
So, as we see the pattern of this day, symbolically, here's some green barley that's, uh, that we just symbolically wave as a, as a wave offering unto our master, signifying the work that our master's done. And in bringing this teaching to you, I hope that you've been concentrating all, <laughs> how long has it been, Luke? Ten hours? <laughs> okay. You know, so I hope that this will ignite in you that fire to be serving Yahweh with everything that you have. This is a reminder that we're in this race. And for some of you, it might feel, oh, get that recovery of breath today because there's still a big race ahead of us that we can run if we throw off everything that entangles and we give praise and celebration to our master. So if anybody does want to, and I also want to ask any of our brothers that are online, if you would like to uh, uh, bring your wave offering before the master and just share with us something, you're welcome to send me a WhatsApp or a message on the Twitch channel. Um, and so anybody here would like to come and do their wave offering before the master. Okay, hey, Patrick, come. Yeah. Hey, Pat. Yeah. I would do this one. Yeah, you can lift it up to Yahweh. I just want to say thank you to Yahweh for keeping me at my age, that he would restore my mind, my memory, and, and everything else. I would bless this money. Thank you. Amen. Henry. I just want to wave this to you for the life he's spared me so far. And also I believe and trust in, in his in his uh, way of leading me in the next couple of months, that might also be a, a quite a new adventure for me. And I trust that uh, he's going to guide me um, in the correct way to strengthen his name through through all this. Yeah. Praise the Abbey. Amen. Ayla. Our online family gets to see you in, in, in person now. And, and so praise you. No, no, Just carry on. Um, I give you thanks, Master Yahweh, with all my heart for your loving commitment and truth. You have made great your word and name in my life that is now a daily living offering to you alone. You alone are my rock, and from you I get my strength to walk in the midst of distress as you revive my being. Hallelujah for Yahshua, the name that saves. Name. Praise Yahweh. <laughs> Okay. Yes, 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 you may. Hmm. It's a little bit longer than it has been here before, but <laughs> I pray that it will work out well. As I humbly come before Yahweh, my Elohim, this day, it is with a heart of thanksgiving and praise to give him all the esteem that he so richly deserves for calling me his Agula. Thank you, thank you, our Father, for being my Yahweh Elohim, who rescued me from the miry clay, washed me clean, and made me whole, and made me yours. Thank you for plowing the hard, untillable soil of my heart into soft, fertile soil, receptive of your word, and creating within me a heart after right and righteousness. Thank you for planting me among like-minded trees that desire to be pleasing in your sight, devoid of seeking the pleasures of this world. Thank you for watering the roots of my heart during times of drought and famine to accomplish your will and purpose for my life in you. Daily you remain the master craftsman in total control of who I am becoming in you if I remain your humble and faithful servant. On my own, I am nothing, but in you I can become who you created me to be, a masterpiece of value to you. 
In this world that has become crazy, self-seeking, self-serving and proud, keep those of us who are seeking after you in spirit and in truth, steadfast on the narrow path of our deliverance, looking forward to what lies ahead with grateful hearts, to becoming yours at your wedding feast. May I, be, may I continue to strive to become more like you in spirit and in truth, more like you, less of me, with a purity of heart that desires that your will and your will alone always be done irrespective of circumstance. Keep my body and spirit pliable and moldable to your purposes for my life. I humbly ask that you continue to bless this FOTC fellowship, that each one who hears the teachings going forth to the four corners of the earth will hear God and do your instructions and make the informed decision to follow you. May we as your family always remain in your service. In Yeshua's mighty and powerful name I pray. Amen and Amen. Amen. My heart is filled with gratitude that Elohim saw my longing to join his household physically um, in celebrating his feast. And I'm grateful and thankful to you, Master Yahweh, that being in the Master is the greatest honor and privilege that I have ever had as he's the giver of life as you are the giver of life also. Mm -hmm. as you are the giver of life and will soon reign and i will soon we will soon reign with you um i know that if it was not for your torah i would have perished in my affliction I would have um, been completely um, done away with, to put that. And I'm, I'm just so thankful for his favor, your favor, and for your love and commitment um, that I don't even deserve. And I thank you, Elohim, for your promises that I yes in Messiah Yahushua. And um, my Redeemer and my Master, my Elohim, well, if your Torah has been, uh, um, this is what, what's big in my heart, that if your Torah has not been my delight, I would have perished. And I know that completely. And I know that I can rely on you for the year ahead because you are the Elohim who sees me and who has me in my um, distresses. And I can enter the year ahead with joy and gladness because I know that you are my Elohim and you have my back and everything, you have everything under control. I just wanted to read. Um, I saw you had it marked on your phone. You want Romans 8. Yes, I just wanted to read Romans 8 verse, from verse 28. Oh, you got it there or do you want to read? Uh, you you yeah. prefer reading there, okay? Yes, it's bigger. It's bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Make the letters big. <laughs> Okay. And we know that all matters work together for good to those who love Elohim, to those who are called according to his purpose. Because those whom he knew beforehand, he also ordained beforehand to be conformed to the likeness of his son, for him to be the firstborn among many brothers. And whom he ordained beforehand, these he also called. And whom he called, this he also declared right. And whom he declared right, this he also esteemed. What then shall we say to this? If Elohim is for us, who can be against us? Truly, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him on behalf of us all, delivered him up on behalf of us all, how shall he not with everything else uh, along with 
him freely give us all else. Who shall bring any charge against Elohim's chosen ones? It is Elohim who is declaring right. Who is he who is condemning? It is Messiah who died. And furthermore, he's also raised up. Who is also at the right hand of Elohim? Who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Messiah? Shall pressure or distress or persecution or scarcity of food or nakedness or danger or sweat? As it has been written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are reckoned as sheep of slaughter. Of slaughter. <laughs> but in all this, we know we know that you are more than overcomers through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor messengers, nor principalities, nor powers, neither the present nor the future, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall ever be able to separate us from the love of Elohim, which is in the cell of Yahushua, our master. Amen. Amen. Uh, just a wave offering to, 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 for ever thankful for what uh, Yeshua has done for us, for giving us his times, his appointments, and uh, and for continually drawing us in there that way. So just a wave offering, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, Ricardo, you okay. Carlos has brought his books, he means business. <laughs> there we go. I just want to present this wave of bring before Yahweh and the message that I want to share today is um, this Omer Rashid is my 12th Omer Rashid and I just realized that I could not be where I am now if it was not for Messiah yeah if it was not for Messiah Mordechai told Esther who knew who knew she was born for such a time as this we don't know all the answers but it is Elohim's desire for us to be here and now at this present time and age for his purpose and this and this way we can take courage and hope to proclaim the good news messiah overcoming death and lives forever for the harvest is great but the workers are few this day is for me the expectation of deliverance and hope of everlasting life it is a day where i recognize the price you are sure paid for my sins it is a day of realizing what his sacrifice means for me and in that realization, it is my duty as a righteous man of the living Elohim to count the cost of following Messiah. And no amount of gold, silver and riches can deter me from my, from my confession of who Messiah is. For gold and silver perishes with the flesh, but he set apart spirit that lives in me, lives, lives on forever. Yahweh chose us as his treasure possession, a royal priesthood, in, in the order of Melchizedek, to serve him in spirit and truth, being a witness to those seeing but not seeing, hearing but not hearing, of the, of the weight of his sacrifice to all nations. Because Yahweh loved us first, we can love him, and his love is apparent in that he himself will lay, lay down his deity to be offered up on our behalf. How do we reciprocate that love? By putting to death sin in our lives that so easily entangle us, staying upright in obedience to his word, through every trial and challenges. 2 John 1 verse 6 says, And this is the love that we walk according to his commands. This is the command that, that this is the command that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Reminiscing about this feast from Pesach to this day made me realize that just once again, I've been redeemed from slavery in a sun worship world as one walking dead, made alive through his set apart spirit washed, cleansed, forgiven, and dressed in righteousness, and through, through the life, death, and resurrection of Yeshua Messiah, my Master, King, and Redeemer, 
given the promise of everlasting life in him. And then something that I just read this morning that I find is quite fitting for today is um, from Psalm 40. I want to read from verse 1 to 10. It says, I waited, waited for Yahweh, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. And he drew me out of the pit of destruction, out of the muddy clay, and he set my feet upon a rock. He is establishing my steps. Then he put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our Elohim. Many do see it and fear, and trust in Yahweh. Blessed is the man who has made Yahweh's trust, and has not turned to the proud, and those turning aside to falsehood. O Yahweh, my Elohim, many are the wonders which you have done, and your purpose to, purposes toward us. There is no one to compare with you. I declare and speak. They are too many to be numbered. Slaughtering and meal offering you did not desire. You have opened my ears, ascending offering and sin offering you did not ask for. Then I said, See, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is prescribed for me. I have delighted to do your pleasure, O my Elohim, and your Torah is within my heart. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in a great assembly. See, I do not restrain my lips. O Yahweh, you know. I did not conceal your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your trustworthiness and your deliverance. I did not hide your loving commitment and your truth from the great assembly. Sometimes it takes an unintended negative comment to make me stop and think about my life in Yahweh so far. I was 10 when we started keeping Sabbath, it naturally being a result of dutifully obeying my parents' instructions, which is quite scriptural. And so maybe I didn't have that sudden moment of realizing I'd been wrong, but that doesn't mean I didn't make a choice. Yes, there is that moment, that switch, of starting to keep Sabbath, Sabbath and the commands and steer away from traditions and worldly ways. And although as a child I was obedient and believed what my parents taught me, it is still a personal decision and each and every day to con a personal decision each and every day to continue in it. It is not a once off choice and just free fall from there. Every moment, thought and action is a choice to obey Yahweh. Now, no longer ten but twenty four, <laughs> I still make mistakes and learn every day to be more set apart, and as a human I still fail at times, but I'm still here. And more importantly, I want to stay here. Nobody's journey looks the same, but we can all come together and worship him as one. I give a song and a contribution this year to him as a thanks for giving me the wisdom to choose him again and again, and also as a prayer for the years to come, to never get complacent, to never stop choosing to serve. He has blessed me so abundantly, and I stand, stand in awe of his great compassion in my life, giving me a safe home and the ability to give an offering back to him of the fruit from a job I love, and to see the tangible increase each year. But mostly, I am so grateful to Yahweh that I get to celebrate his feasts again and again, and that I'm still here. Praise Yahweh. Um, I'm going to play you the song that Rachel has also done along with her offering. She's also done a song this week, so I'll put it on the screen and then put it online for our... It's instrumental, so just in line with the words that she's just written... It is a song that she's composed called Still Here. Just let me get it on there.
Praise Yahweh that we're able to come before his face and declare our love for him and recognize the work that he's begun in us and ending with that wonderful composition that is echoed out of a place of declaring we're still here. And we thank Yahweh that we're still here. Many come and go, but we're all still here. And we thank our master that he is the only one that can keep us, guide us and strengthen us to still be here when he comes. So on this day of the waving of the sheaf, we pray that our master continues to bless every household and our covenant family that is growing online too. We long for that day where we'll get to embrace one another face to face and, and just be in our master's presence together. But for now, while we're sojourning, we can make that declaration that we're still here. So we praise and give thanks and esteem to our King, our Elohim and our Redeemer. So I'm going to close in prayer. And can I just add, like Eva said, okay. like Eva said, when Yeshua said, do you also want to live with me? We say what he says. You have the words of life. Where else would we go? Amen. There's no other place that we would rather be than in our Master who has the words of life. So with that wonderful recognition of what we have in the Master, this is still a wonderful day to celebrate in his presence. I hope that we would hear from some of our family online and communicate too. And tomorrow we're going to be together again at 10 o'clock closing this festival. I'll be sharing another wonderful message, Luke, uh, maybe not as long, <laughs> on, on what the seventh day symbolizes for us in a parable language again. And so it's with great joy that we begin counting and look forward to that which our Master continues to work in and through our lives. Amen. Let's pray. Master Yahweh, it's with joy and a privilege and a thankful heart that we stand here before your face as you commanded to come before your face on this day, that we're able to do so purely by the work that you have begun in us and that which you came to establish as an everlasting covenant in the order of Melchizedek. We thank you that by your work of redemption and your overcoming of death, we have the promise of eternal life and a resurrection to look forward to so that the second death has no power over us. It's because of this day that we can confidently hold firm to our expectation of that resurrection when you come for a ready bride. We pray that we would continue to stay in you because we've got all that we need in you. There's nowhere else to go. Remind us of that even as we begin to count, as we stay in you so that you stay in us. We bless you, Master Yahweh, and thank you for your complete provision, your blessing. And as I speak your name over each and every one of us to put your name upon us as your blessing upon us, we give thanks to you. Amen. Amen. Covenant family online, we pray Yahweh blesses your homes. And for those that are going to watch a bit later, you probably won't see what I'm saying now because I cut it off. But um, Yahweh bless you. It really is a joy that we can get to celebrate this together. And uh, wherever you're at, connect with others where you can. And those who are on their own, please connect with us. We'd love to hear from you. Be part of what we're doing. We can do a video call. This is family. We're all here. So let's. Let's be here together in our master. Amen and amen. See you tomorrow morning. Shalom, shalom.